So, welcome to this lecture, which is a break from the normal sequence we've been going through, focused entirely on data science. We now switch back to look a little bit at prerequisites. And in particular, today we will do a short lecture on basics from probability, which we will be using moving forward, both in machine learning and in the topic on randomized algorithms. So several of you might have seen these uh, topics in some form before, and some might not have. So for completeness, we included this in the sequence between the two machine le uh, learning lectures. We'll be using it explicitly in the machine le learning lecture to follow, which is the second one in, the, in that topic. The lectures were prepared, as always, in cooperation with Professor John Augustine of IIT Madras. And in this instance, we wish to acknowledge contributions from uh, his student there, S. Sumati. So moving on with the topics, there'll be two basic concepts that we'll be covering in the first portion of the lecture, probability spaces and some basic concepts of random variables. So you can think of probability as being built out of performing experiments whose outcomes ultimately can be used to define what probability means. So a random experiment you can think of is a procedure that can be repeated many, many times, technically infinitely many times. And each time that you try it and something comes out, it's called a trial. And the entire concept of probability is based on modeling how to quantify what happens when individual trials occur. So the set of all possible events that define the trial's outcomes are typically characterized by the capital symbol omega. And a set of allowable events from the set of all possible events is we can write it as a family of possible outcomes as the set F, where E is an event. Okay? Each allowed subset of things that can happen, F is clearly a subset of all possible things that can happen, omega. And probability, written using this um, interesting way, uh, form of the letter P, is simply a mapping from the allowed events into the real numbers that satisfy some properties. Cannot be any real number, obviously. So just to give it a little bit of intuition, let's consider omega as having two possible events in it, or possible uh, entities, we can say, because it's a set, head and tail. So that's a coin that's defining our space of experiments. In this case, F, the set of allowed events, is also heads and tails. So now if the coin is in probability terminology, what they call unbiased, you have a 50% chance informally of getting heads as an outcome, 50% chance of getting tails as an outcome. So you would write probability of head equal to probability of tails equal to half, where probability of omega equal to one. Okay, that's the informal notion. So the basic guidelines that now will define probability for us is our function that we are trying to map F to R should satisfy three properties. And then you have a complete definition of probability. So what we have first is that it should be between 0 and 1. The sum of all events, that is what omega maps you into, should be 1. And for any finite, and we're dealing in this instance with finite or what are called uh, countably finite sequence, which broadly is referred to as discrete probability. And since we are looking at discrete events, we are only interested in these types of probabilities. Uh, so any finite or countable finite sequence of pairwise mutually disjoint events, EI, the essential, if you take the union of those and take the probability function, that's the sum of the probability of the individual events. So what do I mean by that? If you take some event E2 and it has nothing in common with E1, it's completely non-overlapping, 
Similarly, E3 is non-overlapping with E1 and E2, and so on. So if you take any two at a time, the event spaces don't overlap. Then the probability of the sum of the events is the sum of the probability of the events. So that's really, uh, uh, so the way you write the sum of the events is a union, and the way you write the post probability value is as the classical sum sigma, okay? So from probability and the concept of what probability is, let's go to a slightly more abstract notion of a concept called a random variable. So to understand this, let's play a game with our coin. And let's say that there are two people playing the game, and if the heads uh, outcome is seen, A wins. If a tails outcome is seen, B wins. And let's, let x be, in this case, we'll call it in future a random variable, be the number of times A wins or loses, and give it a value plus 1 if you see heads, A1, minus 1 if B wins or A loses. Okay? So the question now is, how much can A win in one round when you see a coin toss? It may seem like a slightly ill-posed question, and we'll see why it will make sense in a second. It's leading up to the concept of an expected value for x. Expected is also, you can think of it as an average win. So if you're playing some sort of a card game, or are playing betting against a roll of a die, and you roll 100 times, how much are you likely to win any one time? Is kind of the intuition we are building up to. So using an unbiased coin informally, there's a 50-50 chance that A wins or A loses. Therefore, A is expected to win some amount, and that is the expected value, which is the probability of an event happening and winning one, or probability of the second event happening and losing one, which is minus one. So in this case, the expected gain is zero, okay? So more generally, the quantity that we are interested in is how many times A wins per round of the game. And that would be something which would take a random variable and maps the random variable through a concept such as expectation. And now we will briefly mention, while we are interested in random variables that are discrete, that it take only finite or countably infinite number of values, where if you're interested in being reminded what a countably infinite set is, integers form a countably infinite set because there is no limit. You can keep adding integers, but they're discrete, two, three, four. Whereas skipping to the last bullet, real numbers, and this is a very technical point now, do not form a countably infinite set. If you remember having seen this definition sometime many, many years ago perhaps, you can prove that given any two real numbers, there's a real number between them. So that those type of sets are called uncountably infinite sets. So for the most part, we are interested in countably infinite sets, okay? And th uh, therefore, discrete random variables. So moving forward, we define the thing that we care about the most, an expectation, as we saw in the coin toss game, of a discrete random variable x, ex, is a sum of a particular value, the ith value of the random variable. In the case where a was winning and losing, we had two values, and we summed over two. In general, you can have i values. So for example, if you roll a die, you are likely to have six values. And of course, you can define the random variable to be modeling anything. So if uh, a is playing the game, where if six comes out and A wins 10, and if any other value comes out, A loses five, it's still being mapped into just two random variable values. So a random variable is modeling what is happening in the probability event space more abstractly. So in this case, let's say there's one-to-one -one correspondence. So a random variable xi, the ith uh, outcome, has probability pi, the expectation is simply what you would normally do when you average xi times pi. 
a simple well-known fact that we will be using, so I'll just mention it in passing. If lambda 1 through lambda n are constants, they're not random variables, they're just constant numbers, then it's well known that the expectation of lambda 1 times x1 plus lambda 2 times x2 plus 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 etc. lambda n times xn is simply lambda 1 times expectation of x1 plus the sum etc. lambda n times expectation of xn. It's called the linearity of expectations. Okay? That's just a fact worth knowing. It's a very basic observation about expectations and probability. So I won't uh, discuss this slide. This is again an elementary definition. You know that there is a concept called a variance for a random variable from which you get perhaps something you've heard more commonly, the standard deviation, which is the square root of the variance. It's there on the slide. You can just remind yourself of the definition, building up from the concept of an expectation. So now, using this notion of a random variable, and its basic definition, we can talk about different types of properties of this random variable. The most basic property that we need to talk about is the concept of a probability distribution. So you can build on what we just said and ask the following interesting question. So we define a new random variable, but we'll call it x because it's simple enough. It takes on a value 1 if you get head, success, 0. Uh, if you get a failure, right? So that's a new random variable. So the expectation, just to remind ourselves what this is, is let us take the value 1 times probability x equal to 1 plus 0, because the second term, no matter what the probability, would evaluate to 0, which is simply the probability that x equal to 1, which is, let's call it p. And that's what we assume. So you would get tails with probability 1 minus p. Now you have no longer an unbiased coin. You have a biased coin because p can be a value different than half. So heads can be more likely or less likely than tails. That's the general formulation. So now let us say you toss this coin n times. Okay? And then you are interested in knowing, because you are a person who wants to bet on heads, how many times will I get heads? That's the type of question you want to ask. That's what distributions help you determine. So the sequence of the coin flips that we just saw can be n independent exper experiments. And here independence is an important observation, which says that the third experiment's outcome is not determined by what happened on 1 and 2. And therefore, the third experiment forgets everything about history and so does the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the first and the second, and so on. It's always this probability p with which you'll get what you want based on the definition of the experiment, heads in our case. And let us say that x is the number of successes, as in we wanted heads, right, in n experiments. Then x can be easily posed as something very well known called a binomial distribution where a binomial random variable x with parameter n and p. That means you have n experiments. p is the probability that you'll get what you want out of any one of those experiments. That's, uh, and then you ask, OK, what is the chance that I get j between 0, which is I never get what I want, n, which is what I want always, or something in between. And for that, we have the probability x equal to j is simply the number of ways I can choose j things from n things times the probability of getting it any one time multiplied j times times the probability of not getting it 1 minus p multiplied n minus j times. And this simple form, which we will see a lot in, when you do basic probability, is called the binomial distribution. So that gives you a very crisp way of calculating the probability of getting exactly j heads, with the probability p being what tells you that you'll get a head on any one attempt. 
And of course, you have expectation variance and other attributes for this defined the usual way. Simple observation I'll make in pa passing that the binomial distribution, it's, uh, if you were to work out the expectation, has a value NP. OK? Uh, so the expected number of times you will succeed when you sum between zero time success, one success, two success, three success, j successes through n successes, that average value, number of times you'll get heads with a probability p is np, if you do the simplification. So before we proceed further, I wanted to just mention in passing that we will be next looking at this topic, which is something called tail bounds of distributions. And tail bounds of distributions have to do with ways of estimating what we just saw, what we call expectations, but in a more refined way. And the refinement being, you answer questions such as, what is the probability that I will be away from the average value by a certain amount? How good is my average? 